Good afternoon, folks. Welcome to this afternoon's webinar, or this morning, wherever you are, uh, which is slightly different from normal because we're going to take one photo and edit it in four different ways, which is something I've never done before. Actually, it wasn't my idea. It was Diego's idea, who's also hanging around it in the chat, um, and actually worked out rather well, which is good. Forced me out of my comfort zone a little bit and ended up um, actually picking an edit which I prefer which I never normally would do so that is the plan for us today uh, if you're on Facebook or YouTube welcome thanks for joining feel free to put any questions um, in the chat and we can answer those there as well if you're in the webinar room uh, remember, you'll find the Q&A tab just to your right-hand side. Uh, so feel free to put your questions in there. That just separates them out from the chat. And I'll pick some up, and hopefully Diego will pick some up as well. And we've also got Yulia helping out on YouTube too. So plenty of us to uh, answer questions today. So this is the photo we are dealing with uh, from my buddy Paul Hampton up in Scotland. Uh, this is obviously not Scotland, it's Cuba. Uh, as you can probably guess. So what you're looking at on screen right now is the unedited version. Uh, so what I did yesterday or over the past couple of days was to get to, let's find it, these four different edits like so. Let's hide the browser. I'll hide my head in a second so you can see the bottom right one better. But top left, this is just going to be like a normal edit. So keeping control of the shadows uh, and the highlights, not doing anything particularly fancy, but just a nice general edit to get the best out of the picture. Uh, now we've got over on the right hand side, a black and white, obviously, uh, but that uses a luminosity mask just to do some sneaky control with the highlights in a bit more of a targeted way. Bottom left, we've gone for more of a bit of a color grade and also a couple of use of style brush. We've added a bit of haziness in the top left hand corner. And behind me, let's just get rid of me for a second. Uh, this is an edit I would never normally kind of direction that I would go in, but more contrasty. We're working with the color editor to uh, give a bit more emphasis on some colors and take emphasis on other colors away. So a very different edit to what I would normally do, but it actually turned out my favorite in hindsight. Normally I would edit probably more like this or more like this, um, but it was a bit of a surprise to me that I preferred that one. So that is the plan. Now it probably won't take an hour. Imagine 45 minutes is a bit closer. So let's get started. So what I did was, as you can see all these numbers, you know, on the right hand side and just behind me, these equate to various different variants. So that's just virtual copies of the same shot, which we can collapse by hitting that little icon up the top. Uh, what I did, which I would never normally do, don't do this kids, um, is to duplicate the raw file and rename it just so I had a, a fresh one, which I can edit here basically because I wanted to retain my four original edits from yesterday and not end up with eight different variants uh, and have, you know, thumbnails all over the place. So that's why I've done that, but I would never normally do that. So this is our unedited straight out the box image. So the first thing we're going to do is make a new variant. Now a new variant is a virtual copy. We're not uh, duplicating the raw file. We're just giving another preview, if you like, thumbnail for Capture One uh, to deal with. Um, new variant will just make the virtual copy with no adjustments. Clone variant, the second option, that will make a virtual copy but with the current set of adjustments. As this photo has no adjustments on it, it's not going to make any difference what I pick. So let's just choose new variant. So the first thing that I'm going to do is crop it. So let's grab a the crop tool and we're going to go a bit more panoramic. So let's squeeze up from the bottom and just bring this in so we sit the car a bit more on the thirds like so. Probably don't need to crop the building. So let's do that. And we're going to use that same crop on each of the photos so a comparison is easy and I'll show you how we can borrow the crop and send it over to each of the pictures too. Saying that, let's just do a little bit more. So this is going to be our normal edit, how I would normally edit. So generally I start off with the crop 
Uh, generally, I then start off with using the adjustments down here. So again, it's a bit easier to see what's going on on each of our layers. Um, I'm just gonna make a new field adjustment layer, which I'm just gonna call the basics. And uh, normally I would just operate off working on the background and then build my layers, um, but I've stolen this technique from my colleague Maria, uh, who you might have seen on a previous live stream, uh, just so we can turn this layer on and off and see what you know the basic adjustments are doing as well. So this is a field layer, so it's gonna affect the whole shot. So the first thing that I wanna do, exposure is pretty good. I feel the white balance is maybe a bit too much on the warm side, so I'm just gonna rack this back a touch, not by too much because the warmth is kind of sympathetic to the shot. So we're just gonna do that. Generally, what we're also looking to do is have a quick look at our levels. You can see, you know, this is bang on exposure pretty much. It's good straight out of the camera, nice even spread of tones from shadows to highlights, not much missing information either side. Um, so not really a great deal we need to do there. If I need to pull it in, I could just tweak it in a tiny bit. Generally though, hitting the auto button if we're on the background layer would make sense. Auto doesn't work on a field layer for some strange reason, <laughs> not sure why. Anyway, not much we need to do with the levels on this respect. Looking at the roof of the car, we can see it's getting a little bit on the bright side. Um, highlights generally are okay. So you'll see here, if I pull the highlights down, that's gonna give an effect to the road, the sky, let's just go dramatic, bit of the roof and so on. Now it kind of looks a bit flat and that HDR look. So in this case, I pull the whites down a little bit and just the highlights a touch as well. So that's gonna give back some detail in the roof of the car. So if we turn basics off and back on again, so you can see it's just pulled it down a little bit, but it's not dimming it too much. If you're not sure what the whites are doing, then really that's a very critical adjustment at this end of the histogram. So it's really controlling the brightest parts, whereas the highlight slider is kind of doing this much. So the top third, if you like, the whites really just the top 10%. So if we turn on our exposure warning, we've got a little bit of burnout there, but that's fine because we can see it's a specular highlight where the sun's bouncing off, no point recovering that. Uh, and there's just a touch on the bonnet as well, but I feel that's almost a bit of a specular burn going on, so I'm not worried about that too much. The main thing was just to get some details back in the roof lining like so. I'll add a little tiny touch of clarity, which is our mid-tone contrast, and a little bit of extra, not too much, just you know, one or two points of contrast. And that pretty much completes a normal edit. I think that's all I did yesterday. <coughs> Excuse me, let's just have a quick check. Oh yeah, that was one other thing I did. So if we go back to this one, if we look at these guys down in the bottom left-hand corner, for a normal edit where we're just trying to liberate good detail from the highlights, good detail from the shadows, these guys are sitting a little bit too much in the dark. Now, if we use the shadow slider to open them up, like so, kind of loses its feel a little bit as well. All I really want to do is just see into this area a bit more, but in a subtle way. If we open up the blacks, that will open up the darkest areas, which is not too bad. We can also try lifting up the shadows and dropping the blacks down which also isn't too bad. That's probably my most liked effect. Or we can do a very quick style brush swipe and open up the shadows in just this area. Now, normally you'll find your style brush is sitting in the exposure tool tab. What I've done is create my, excuse me. What I've done is create my own tool tab, custom tool tab, just for style brushes. If you don't know how to do that, just right click anywhere in this dead space and you can add your own custom tool tab. And once you've done that, you can right click again in the empty tool tab space and just add the tools you need. And you can see I've added the layers tool and the style brush tool. So that just gives me a bit more space. It was getting a bit kind of busy in the exposure tool tab for my liking. Okay, so under built-in style brushes, we've got uh, shadows recover. 
So if we click that, straight away that's going to set up my brush settings. So if I right click, I can see we've got a certain size set and a certain opacity and flow. As I want this to be really subtle, I'm just going to bring the flow down a couple more points. And what the flow allows us to do is to build up the adjustment slowly. So I can do a few swipes, whether you're with a pen or a mouse, it doesn't make any difference, but it means that style brush adjustment will just come in nice and gradually. So if I just do a little bit of brushing around here and stop, might not look like, um, whoops, wrong shortcut, might not look like anything has happened, but if I turn off shadows recover, you can just see what it's done and I'm gonna pull the opacity down a bit so it's even more subtle. There we go. So that's our first edit, really. So if we turn on before and after, all we're doing really is controlling the highlights, opening up the shadows a little bit, adding a touch of contrast, and away we go. So it's really a very simple, nice edit, which is something I would typically do just for a you know quick, simple photo like this. If we turn off the basics, so just our simple exposure adjustments contrast and then we've just opened up the shadows there a little as well so that's number one so number two if you remember looking at what we did earlier was to go black and white like so so the first thing that we need to do is if we grab the one we've just edited is to make another variant now should i clone the variant or should i make a new variant so I would be tempted, as we're doing black and white, just to start again, especially as this shot has, you know, a really good base exposure. So I didn't have to do a lot of heavy lifting of exposure correction and contrast correction. If I had done that, then I might decide to clone it. But as it's pretty good out of the camera in terms of those base settings, I'm just going to say new variant like so. The one thing I do want, though, is uh, the crop tool or not the crop tool, the crop, sorry. So if I, let's just um, hide me for a second. So if I just select the one that we just did and the variant that I just made, so this one underneath, all I want to do is borrow the crop from this guy and put it on this guy. So we can do that with any of our tools in Capture One. So all we need to do is find the crop tool look for this little up down arrow like so you can see what the help bubble says copy settings to adjustment hold down shift to apply immediately so if i hold down my shift key on the keyboard and just click the up down arrow then hey presto the crop gets transferred across so that works with any adjustment tool that you would want to use in capture one could be an exposure adjustment could be a layers adjustment we probably need to do that that later but just a super simple way to get that adjustment across. Okay, so this is gonna be our black and white. So the first thing that we need to do is enable black and white. Now, black and white doesn't work on a layer, so there's no point me building a basics layer here. Um, we're just gonna turn on enable black and white, like so. Now, this will activate these six sliders, one, two, three, four, five, six, which essentially controls the uh, density of um, each of those color channels. So you can probably guess what's gonna happen when I grab red, it's gonna play around with the car and anything else which has some red tones in it, also the traffic light, which you can see in the background. So I'm gonna just darken that a little bit. Yellow is gonna be the building mostly in the back. I'd like to keep that a bit brighter. Green, I doubt there's much going on. Nope, cyan probably the same a little bit but not much blue there's that truck behind and magenta again not so much else so depending on the color content of the photo will directly respond to uh, how much effectiveness those sliders have so in this shot not a great deal so right now if we go back to our exposure tool tab We've got a pretty nice black and white. The only thing I don't like is that the road is a bit harsh in terms of its brightness. So we need to control that to some extent. In terms of other adjustments, I would personally like to put a bit of extra contrast in there. And for this, I generally go towards using the Luma Curve. The reason for that is that 
a luma curve is just a straight luminosity adjustment where the color stays stable. Now, if you remember, we just went back to this tool and said these sliders control the density of each of these colors. So if I was to saturate a color more by using an RGB curve, it could actually change the density a little bit as well. So by sticking with the Luma curve, then we can get slightly finer control of our contrast decisions. It's a bit pedantic, to be honest. I would say a lot of the time you'd be fine with an RGB curve, but for peace of mind, Luma is gonna give me the best results. So uh, I would like to just do a simple S-curve to add a little bit more contrast like so. Now, as I said, I'm not too happy with the road being that bright. It's a little bit too glaring. So let's see what happens if we pull our highlight slider down. So if we pull this guy down, has the desired effect. So I would wanna to go to something like this. But what I don't like is that it makes the sky a bit dull, as you can see, and it also makes the this side of the building a bit dull and so on. Really, the only thing I want to do is target it to the road. So we've got a couple of choices. We could do a quick kind of rough mask over the road and, and so on, and then adjust it. We could try a style brush, but another thing in this situation, which would be very quick for you to use if you were doing it, as I'm gonna demo it, it seems like it would take longer, but it's actually pretty fast, is to use a Luma range, because we can simply say, just target the highlights, except for a particular area. So if we start with a new field adjustment layer, so that's a mask over the whole shot. Now to visualize this easier, we're gonna turn on our grayscale mask. And what the grayscale mask does is hide the photo and just show us the mask in gray ranges. So white at the moment, or it looks white at the moment because everything is fully masked. If it was black, it would mean there is no mask. So what we're gonna do now is put a Luma range on top of that. So you'll see in a second, as we squeeze down the shadow side of things, that's gonna cut out the shadows. We want all of our highlights. And then what I'm looking to do is just find the compromise between cutting out as much as possible, but not too much of the road. So something like that. So if we just move this out the way down here for a second, we've got a selection of the road, all the brightest areas, bit of the bonnet, which could probably do with some control as well, over in this section like so. So that's just a mask of those brightest areas. Now, if we apply that and zoom in and look at the edge of the mask, you can see it's a bit on the crude side. And sometimes that can't look or doesn't look too great when you start making adjustments. So going back into the Luma range, you'll see two other sliders, radius sensitivity. These control the edge handling of the mask, if you like. Now with radius at zero, this sensitivity slider does nothing. So I could drag this slider all around everywhere and it would make no difference. So we need to dial in a bit of radius. So this is how much it spreads out from the edge of the mask. So a low radius will just focus on the edge itself, a high radius will kind of move out towards the masked and unmasked edges. Now with sensitivity at zero, that's gonna feather the edges, which can be quite handy. With sensitivity at 100, that's gonna refine the edges. So it will trace around the edge really carefully. So any little fibers would be, you know, found around, masked around properly and so on. But I'm gonna do a compromise just something like that around here. So that gives me a slightly nicer edge. So now I've got my mask just attacking my highlights. So that's step one. You could do that pretty quickly if you were just um, doing this without obviously having to show anyone. So let's just call that highlights. Uh, now if I do the same thing, of course, if I adjust my highlights, it's doing what I want on the road and the car bonnet, um, but it's um, also making the sky. So we're just gonna do a quick mask adjustment. So if we bring up our grayscale mask again, grab the erase brush, I can just say, let's take out this area. I need max flow. So then, whoops, one second, let's just get rid of that bit. 
there's a note in the sky. I also don't want it to affect the side of that building, to be honest, kind of like that, a bit brighter. So now we've really just got it on our road system like so, and a bit of the car. So now when I pull the highlights down, that does the job. Because I like the fact that it's bright here. I wouldn't expect the sky to suddenly get darker as well. The sun's bouncing off the side of the building. I feel it looks better that it's nice and bright. Shadow and highlights wise, we might borrow our other layer in a second. But before we do that, let's just have a look at the fabulous grain tool, which we're gonna use a couple of times. Heavily uh, underrated tool in Capture One. Lots of people don't know it's there, so do go and find it. Not restricted to uh, working with um, black and whites, of course. You can use this on color as well, which we will on the last shot. The important thing to know about the film grain tool in Capture One is that we're not just simply sticking a grain uh, scan or like a overlay on top of the photo with some kind of opacity. It's actually more embedded into the picture. So the grain, pat, uh, the grain structure slash pattern is gonna vary depending on the underlying image. So it looks very, very natural. So I'm gonna go for tabular grain, which is kind of close to what Tmax would look like. Impact is like an opacity, how obvious the grain is. And granularity, you've guessed it, is how grainy. So fast film, sorry, um, yeah, fast film, slow film. So I'm gonna go for something like that. Um, we'll look at a different grain style later, but there's all kinds of different combinations that you can play with. Nothing right, nothing wrong, but just gives a super nice effect. So I'm pretty happy with that. We've got the same issue with these dudes in the front. So all we can do is just borrow this layer. So how do we copy just one layer? So same thing as before, I'm just gonna shift select this one and my black and white just behind my head, like so. Click on the up down arrow here, but not holding down shift because I only want the shadows layer so I can uncheck basics. And as soon as I say apply, it's gonna put that shadows layer across to this shot. So watch our gentleman in the front, away we go. That just brighten that up a little bit. So if it doesn't work on this shot, we can either open it up a bit more or we can knock the opacity back depending what we like. So I'd probably I'd give this one a little bit more. Yep, like so. So there we go, happy with the black and white edit. Um, y on our keyboard to activate before and after. So you know what the original shot looks like. And here it is with a black and white, like so. Similar to before, but if you remember, we had our little highlight trick just to pull the highlights back on the road, uh, but leave the sky out. Now we could have probably done that with the style brush as well. But I like the fact that it picked out all the brightest areas, including you know this spot, this spot over here, in a pretty speedy operation. As I said, if you were doing that, you'd be able to knock that out um, pretty quickly as well. Let's see, uh, Jim says, when uh, doing black and white does it make sense to do white balance adjustments before changing to black and white <coughs> excuse me yep and as diego said in his answer he usually does and that's something i should have done before tweaking that because if the wild balance if the white balance is wildly out then you're not going to get necessarily the best range of colors so i probably should have tweaked that before going into it you'll see as we pull it around notice how much difference the white balance actually has to the shot. So it is important to tweak that before going to black and white. In this case, it was kind of close, so it didn't matter too much. Okay, number three, which is my second favorite edit, I think. So if you remember from yesterday's, that was this one. So this is a bit of vintagey color grading going on, bit of flare in the top left-hand corner, Keen eyes will notice I've borrowed that layer once more and we've got a separate color grading layer. So let's reconstruct that. So once again, uh, we're gonna make a new variant, like so. Uh, we're gonna grab the crop again, doesn't matter which one I use. So I'm just gonna, behind my head again, this guy, I'm just gonna do a 
shift select and grab both those pictures, go to the crop tool, hold down my shift key and then click on plus minus, sorry, up down arrow, and then that will grab the crop like so. So this is gonna be our color graded one. Um, once again, do we need to do any basic stuff? Uh, let's just tweak the white balance once more. Um, we're gonna do most of this on our color grading layer. So if anything, I don't really wanna to add too much contrast. Don't wanna to add too much clarity. Uh, let's control our highlights a bit and our whites as we did before, like so, and add a teeny bit of contrast, but not much. So that's enough just before we get into uh, the color grading side of things. So I'm gonna do the color grading on a layer. The reason for that is because one, uh, we can vary the opacity afterwards if we've overdone it too much. Uh, secondly, we can introduce some other adjustments. One of them is gonna be saturation. Um, and we can turn that layer on and off and see what it's doing as well, nice and easily too. So a new field adjustment layer. Uh, I'm gonna start by racking down the saturation to around here, so it's gonna be more subtle. And then we're gonna go over to our color balance tool, which if you haven't used, is a dead simple tool. What you see is what you get. So we've got these three color wheels, shadows, midtones, highlights. Wherever I pick up this uh, central circle and move it, that's the color tint we're gonna go across. So we're gonna do typically tealy shadows and we're gonna warm up our midtones and also our highlights. And I can be relatively aggressive because we pulled that saturation down quite a bit, if you remember. Uh, let's just take it away from the oranges a bit. And with no adjustment, we're down here, but we're looking for almost just a warm tone like so. If we want to, we can play around with the saturation a bit more, so I could take that down a little more to be a bit more aggressive, as you can see. Uh, and the other thing I did with this was to play on the fact that it's a little bit hazy in the background and enhance that a bit more. And once again, that was done with a style brush. So if we go to our style brushes, you'll find a really handy one called Soft Flare, like so. Now looking at this brush, when we go over to the shot, this has a nice low flow. I'm probably gonna make this even lower because I want it to build in super slowly so it looks as natural as possible. And then make this a bit bigger, whopping great brush, and then just start to flare it up in this area, like so. Now I might go a bit more than I probably normally would because very nicely we can just pull down the opacity. That's no flare. That's a bit more, I'm gonna balance it there and just add a little bit more. Now that's maybe getting a bit too fake. So if we've gone too far, you've got two choices. We can obviously right click and clear the mask and start again. If we just wanna reduce the entire effect, then we can use opacity. If we want to take a bit out or reduce what we've just done in one area, then we can use our erase brush. But there's a really important step when you're doing adjustments like this uh, is to make sure you've got this box checked, eraser with brush in the link section. So what this means is that if I have eraser with brush ticked, when I go into my eraser and we right click, it's got all the same settings as the brush. So it's the same size, softness, flow. So if I wanna take away what I've done, then I can do so you know, at the same rate as well. So that way I can just reduce my slightly over the top flare on those gents like so. Um, also having link with layer means that when you switch between layers, look at the size of my brush for a second. When we go to soft flare, notice it's nice and big. When we go to this one, it changes size. So linking with the layer means that if you're going back and forth between your layers, then you don't have to think about your brush size. So how's soft flare looking? That's probably a bit more realistic, that's good. 
what does this actually do for any of the style brushes if you want to see what's actually um, happening uh, for soft flare you know, I believe it's just a curve adjustment so if we look at RGB curve all we've done is grabbed the shadow slider and just racked it way up the top so if you want to lessen the effect of it you can also pull that down a touch as well but a nice simple adjustment which works uh, pretty good okay um, this one we didn't name sorry we're gonna call that color grade like so and last but not least probably once again let's borrow our shadows recover so if I do shift click turn off highlights and do apply that opens up our shadows down at the front might not need as much for this one as it's a bit flary we just take that down a bit a touch like so so once again uh, we've got let's just turn these off so that's with our just you know simple very little adjustments white balance contrast highlights and shadows bit of whites color grade so that was including the saturation like so and our color balance tool soft flare was just adding a little bit of whoops that's interesting ploof in the background hang on a minute it's a nice little graphics hiccup there we go <laughs> soft flare in the background like so and shadows we're just opening up the shadows like so as well so looking at what we've done so far so the various different three so let's just shift click all of these hide the viewer so that's our normal edit for want of a better word black and white and then our color graded more vintagey looking edit like so let's just check on the questions i saw one from david i printed black and white films so there was black blacks white whites and gray tones from near white to near black otherwise i'd get gray death that many digital black and white conversions show oh god we could probably uh answer that for oh sorry just added gerhard at the same time um we could probably talk about that for hours but i think goes down to your personal preference and, and style as as well of course um, I prefer fairly contrasty black and whites but equally looking around you'll find completely the opposite as well so I think as long as you like it that's that's really all there is to it Christian was asking how much difference does the grain look on a print versus a digital export does this play into your decision as to how much to use um yeah it would actually because remember when we're looking at a shot here if we zoom into 100 percent, you know that's a pretty big zoom level if you like if we print that it's going to depend how big it's printed as well so if you don't have your own printer unfortunately you don't have the luxury of running test prints but i imagine with practice you would probably be able to eye in how much grain you would need for a given print size but you're completely right I think there would be a level of uh, experimentation there as well so okay let's go on to the last one which I said accidentally was my favorite and probably the most uh, not complex but the most biggest use of various different tools uh, so uh, just to remind you what I was going to try and do sorry if we expand that out this is the last edit so this is going more contrasty still borrowing our layer that we've used on the other stuff uh, using the color editor and you'll see why when we edit it to take the emphasis off certain colors and put the emphasis back on other colors just to, as a way of steering attention as well so let's collapse those variants open up these ones and we need to make our final new variant like so which is behind my head excuse me so we've got our final new variant let's borrow the crop once more from this guy you know the drill by now find the crop tool shift click and then now we're at uh, the right crop like so so for this one how do we start that's a very good question so I would correct the white balance because I think if it's too warm it's just knocking the exact um, color of the car in, into the wrong direction so let's call that off a little bit uh, we're going to go super contrasty with this one but we should probably still hope to try and 
pull back our whites and highlights a bit. That might all go to pot when we start dialing in the contrast. Let's just hit auto levels as well. And that's gonna tuck in our shadows and the highlights quite nicely. So already compared to the first edit, we're probably a little bit more contrasty. So let's build in a new layer, field layer called contrasty stuff. So we can turn this on and off if needs be. So we're gonna be much more aggressive and add more clarity. Less worried about the shadows blocking up and a touch of contrast as well. We might do a bit more later on if we're feeling brave, even though that, that's more than I would normally like, but let's counteract that just by pulling the whites back down a bit. If we open up the shadows and pull the blacks down, we can still maintain our contrast um, but without it getting too aggressive, if you like. And don't forget, because we've put this on a layer, we can go from not contrasty to super contrasty with our opacity slider. So we can always look at that and make a judgment call at the end and see if we need to back that off a bit. Now for this shot, we've got two pretty dominant colors. We've got car in the front, building in the back. Now I feel for this shot now, as we've boosted up the contrast, this has saturated this a little bit more and it's taken over the shot almost. So it would be nice to take the edge off this slightly. So we'll also do this on a field adjustment layer and call this color stuff so we can turn it on and off as well. So if we go to our advanced color editor and I'm gonna use the advanced color editor because the main benefit between basic and advanced is that advanced means we can also control the saturation range of our color pick, which is kind of important on this shot as well. So the first thing I wanna do is knock out some of the color in this. So grabbing our color picker down here, let's click on the building. Capture One gives me a suggested color range. I don't quite know what areas this is gonna affect. So I'm gonna turn on the checkbox at the bottom here, view selected color range. Now everything will go to monochrome, which is not part of the selection. Now this color selection has picked up quite a bit. Now the dot is my exact color pick on the building. So I was what, somewhere around here. So I want to have the contrasty colors in, but I want to cut out the less contrasty, sorry, the less saturated, not contrasty. Because <coughs> we're picking up a bit from the road because we've still got a bit of color tinge there. So if I do that, we might just have to move my color pick a bit. <clears throat> now we've isolated the road. Don't wanna go too far this way because look what happens if we zoom in. We're actually cutting out the balcony. So I wanna make sure I keep that in, but we want to cut out as much as the road as possible. So I might have to just compromise and go something like that. <clears throat> I don't wanna desaturate the car, so I'm gonna come away from the reds. So you see, if I go in this direction, we're including the car. If I go in this direction, we wanna cut it out. So I'm gonna come away from the reds like so. So now I've got a fairly good selection on just the building. So turn off view selected color range. And now I can pull the saturation down and then it's really not as dominant as it was. We could almost darken it, not darken it. So let's just take some of the saturation out. Now to do the opposite, we wanna make this guy look a bit bigger, bolder, brighter and so on. So we're gonna grab our color picker once more. I'm not gonna pick on the lightly saturated bits. I'm gonna pick on, let's go here. View selected color range once more. Now having a look at the building in the background, that's pretty much not part of that. So that's not a bad selection of the car. Uh, if we go in this direction, we start to lose it a bit, you see. If we take out the less saturated, we lose it on the side. So we wanna make sure that's included. Um, probably not a lot going on with the purples as we go into there. So that's a fairly good selection of the car. There's a little bit of the building. So let's just make sure we do a good, probably about there, I would say. That's a pretty good selection. And now if we turn off view selected color range, 
we can give this a bit more saturation like so. If we pull the hue in this direction, then imagine that dot is being moved around to, you know, purples, magentas and so on in this direction. If we go in this direction, it's pushing it that way towards orange, yellow and so on. So where it is right now, I would probably like to go slightly in that direction just to keep it away from being too orangey. So it's minor correction, but not much. And then we can be quite aggressive with our saturation. We could potentially make it a bit darker. The only thing I would say with this saturation slider, there's no um, safety limit on it, if you like. So I can go up to 200 and that would look pretty appalling, I could, you could imagine. So the saturation slider in the exposure tool does hold your hand ever so slightly. So this one, just be a bit careful that you're not going beyond the limits of what looks nice. There we go. Now, once again, if we wanted to, we could borrow our fabulous layer from earlier if we need it. Don't know if we do. So let's grab uh, shadows and then watch when we say apply. He brightens up a little bit. Don't think it, oops, where is it? This one. Don't think it hurts. Just gives a bit more life into the front there, a tiny bit. But as we're going contrasty, then I think it's fine that it's a bit more aggressive anyway. Last thing we can do, let's do a slightly different grain. Let's go for soft grain this time and bring up the impact as well, like so. So all kinds of different grain types here. There's no right or wrong. You can just experiment with what you prefer. So tabular grain is if you're used to the T-Max look. Uh, soft grain is just a bit more subtle. So let's bring it up to that kind of level. Looking back at our layers. So we didn't do much on the background. Bit more, um, uh, you know, highlight control as normal, adjusted our white balance as we have done with the others, added some contrasty stuff, which in hindsight, if we think is too aggressive, we could pull it back, but I'm all about the aggression today. And then the color stuff that was to reduce the impact of this in favor of bringing attention to this. So when we turn this layer on, it's almost like a, we flipped the switch there. The only thing I will check is I'm a bit worried this one, let's look at this one a second. Yeah, it's having a bit of an effect on the building. So we might just have to sneak, gradually sneak away. As long as we get the impression that this is a bit more, that's better. This, this selection was just starting to creep in on the building. So if we turn this one on and off, that's before and after. And then if we turn this one on and off, before and after, like so. So that's doing the job which I want it to do now, perfect. So it always helps to go back through your layers, see what each one's doing, make sure it you know, has your expectation as well. So out of these four, what's your fave? <laughs> so if we pick out the four that we've just done, no idea if they're gonna look anything like yesterday's. We'll compare that in a second just for fun. Highly unlikely, uh, let's just hide me for a second. So our normal edit, our black and white edit with the luminosity and the highlight trick. This one with our color grading and our soft flare. So if you remember, if we turn that up just a tiny bit, not much, maybe I'll make it more. That's the other benefit of working on layers. You can always retrospectively go back and fiddle with stuff. And our color grade with a color balance tool and a lower saturation. And then last but not least was our more aggressive postcardy style using the color editor as you saw to take the intensity out the building and add intensity to the car in front. Uh, do they look anything like yesterday's? Probably not. Let's actually see what yesterday, let's just compare this one. I won't go through all of them. So that's the one we just did. This is the one Oh, different crop as well, David. Huh. Uh, so that's the one we just did, and that's the one I did yesterday. It's actually not a million miles away. I've knocked out the building more and actually done a more aggressive crop. I think I actually prefer this crop now. Don't like cutting the building in half, but there we go. But, but uh, fairly close. If we look at our 
color graded one. Uh, that would be this one compared to color graded one. Actually even less saturated yesterday and warmer today. There we go. Just goes to show, <laughs> can't match the edits. Let's bring up all five of them. Let's hide the browser, hide the tools. Oh, let's bring me back as well. Uh, so top left is our control, if you like, which just has the crop and no other options. Let's have a, a last little um, check of questions. Uh, one from Zefani, Zefania, sorry. Uh, can you use it for dodging and burning for portraiture? Yeah, absolutely. So you can either create your own dodge and burning levels uh, or you can very simply just use a style brush where we have a built-in burn preset, if you like, and a built-in dodge preset. So yes, you can very easily dodge and burn without any issues. Uh, Avo, would you recommend Nick Collection or, or any plugin? Uh, to be honest, I don't think there's anything in the Nick Collection. Sorry, I turned your question off a bit quick. I don't think there's anything in the Nick Collection that you can't achieve within Capture One. So I would learn about the color tools, learn about the black and white tools, learn about sharpening noise reduction before considering if you need a plugin, because as I said, I don't think there's anything that you can do in the Nick Collection that you can't already do in Capture One. Uh, yes, Clive, it always goes straight to YouTube, so you can watch it right now you can just rewind it if you wish um, but it's live to tape if you like so it's on youtube immediately uh, as we finish okay um let me just check webinar questions um christian said sadly my printer died yesterday so i have to wait to experiment <laughs> yeah it's always a problem with printers if they don't get used enough they do tend to do that as well uh, Alan was saying, how is it that the style brushes colors black and white? Didn't see that coming. Yeah, what Alan is saying, if you use any of like balance warm, balance cool style brushes, it actually works on the black and white, but it will do so because we are using the color balance tool. So if I, for example, boost up the shadows, you can see the black and white changing above me. But if you wanted to have like a toned black and white, we could just shift these controls and then you've got yourself a nice way to tone black and white, triple tone as well. So if you haven't tried that, uh, give that a go as well. And I think that makes us wrap up for those questions. So thanks for joining us today, everybody. I hope you found that interesting. Uh, as I said, it wasn't my idea for a webinar, it was Diego's, and one which I was really worried about doing because I didn't have a clue how I would edit four photos, sorry, one photo in four different ways. Uh, but it's actually a really fun exercise, which I would recommend you try yourself as well. Because out of all of these, this one is probably my favorite. Uh, let's just deselect the others, one second. So this one is probably my favorite, which is not how I would generally edit at all. So I would, normally edit something closer to probably that one i would say that that would be closer to my style so to actually prefer that one which i didn't think i would like was quite a surprise but you know there we go so thanks for joining everybody look out for new webinars actually on tuesday we're on youtube in the afternoon where we're going to talk about different ways to create masks you saw some today with the luminosity uh, masking with style brushes uh, and so on so join us on Tuesday in the afternoon on YouTube you'll already see the placeholder on the live stream playlist on the front page uh, if you subscribe as well then you'll also get a little notification so you always know when we're going live so that's well worth doing on our YouTube channel too thanks for joining again and see you all in the near future take care and bye now